Hello and welcome to Lecture 2A in English 272 Survey of English Literature 2, Romanticism, the Return of Balladry. In this, I am Dr. Renee Dupre and in this very short lecture we will take a look at the role of ballads in the emerging form of romantic poetry. Here are the things that I'll cover today. I'll speak briefly about the resurgence of balladry during the Romantic era, why it happened, and what the Romantics were thinking of as they returned to that earlier era of medieval ballads, some of the effects that it had on Romantic poetry, then we'll look at the specific features of a ballad, some of the stylistic and structural issues that we see when we find a ballad, and finally we'll take a brief look at one of the ballads I asked you to read for this week, Lord Randall, and um, then I'll conclude by asking you to take a little bit of time to examine the poem yourself. First, the resurgence of balladry. There was a large resurgence of interest in ballads during the Romantic era, partly because the Romantics saw it as an earlier way of life, more pure. These were relics. These were things that came from a time that wasn't mediated by the written word, by the printing press, by a time that wasn't affected by the large steam engines, the industrialization that was happening. That pure natural world that the Romantics were so interested in seemed to be emblemized in the ballad. It was much closer to nature. The immediacy of the singer and the audience allowed the Romantics to start to look at the sound of poetry, the importance of the oral verbal delivery of language and its sound. Most importantly, these were oral traditions that were passed on from person to person, from family to family, but they were not mediated by the technology of the printing press. The way that the words were actually spoken or sung was not altered by basically a machine. So there was a lot of interest in the ballad and what it could mean for poetry, especially from some of the more famous poets like Wordsworth. So when we start to look at romantic poetry now with asking the question of what is the impact of the ballad and this interest in the ballad on the poetry itself, there are several really, really important effects that we can see. First of all, the sound, the very melodic, heavy rhythms and rhyming of the ballad we can see transferred into much of the poetry that was written by during the era. Um, we can see thematically a lot of nostalgia for a lost world, for the pure world. The child is the father of the man. Those intimations of immortality that Wordsworth spoke of. That pure world that was not mediated by the technology even of the written word on the page. Another important thing that we can pull out of this interest in the ballad was the Romantics' interest in really redefining poetry. So it wasn't just restricted to high culture. It was not just something that was refined and elegant and made for the upper classes, but poetry was really something that was accessible to everyone. Um, and remember, as we spoke about earlier, the extreme popularity of poetry during this era. There's never been an era like it in which poetry was just so widely read. Um, the ballad is a very conventional form. Nothing frightening about it to people who would encounter it. It would be very familiar. Most people would have heard some sort of ballad. Somebody would have sung one in their lifetimes. But many of the poets would use that conventional form to express some of these new and radical ideas that we've talked about previously around the importance of individual, feeling, emotion, even starting to move toward our contemporary notion of romantic love. The ballad also provided fodder for many people to start experimenting with form, blending some of the genres. There was a lyric poem and the ballad and Wordsworth, for example, combined those in his lyrical ballad. 
which is probably the most famous example of that really radical experimentation with form. So those are some of the things that we should be looking for and um, be aware of as we move through the rest of the semester and reading some of the poetry that we will be reading. So when we look at a ballad, what are some of the features of a ballad? One of the key things that we see is regular meter. And by meter, for those of you who are not already well versed in reading of poetry, the meter is simply the rhythm of each line. What's the pattern that emerges as we reach, read each line, the pattern of emphasis on the, of the language? We'll see a lot of refrains and repetition as we, and Lord Randall, which we'll sp speak about in a moment, really has a wonderful example of that repetition of the refrain. We'll see that over and over in the ballad. And that probably historically simply made it easier for people to remember. Um, it also creates a sense of familiarity, a sense of knowledge for the, the listener, and something again that the Romantic poets would experiment with. When we're looking at a ballad, we often see a specific structure to the stanza. Again, the stanza is probably the equivalent of the paragraph in the poem. The standard ballad stanza looks like it's a quatrain, four lines, with alternating four beat and three beat lines. And the beats are what we refer to when we're talking about the meter. So there are going to be four emphasis. There's going to be an emphasis four times in one line and then an emphasis three times in the next line. The rhyme scheme is A, B, C, B. And again, let me translate that for those of you who are not familiar with reading a lot of poetry, or formal poetry especially. The rhyme scheme is the words that rhyme at the end of the each line. And so we'll see in Lord Randall, again, an example of that A, B, C, B rhyme scheme. So the words, the last word in the first line and the third line don't rhyme, but the last words in the second and fourth line do. It's just one of the forms of poetry that we're very, um, that's very, pretty well defined. Another feature of the ballad is its simplicity. It's not a world of complex imagery. It's not a world of complex meter. It's very simple. It's a very, um, is it, it does, the ballad does not lend itself to the complexity of, say, the epic poem, which we'll also look at. But it's a simple form of poetry, although it can contain many, many complex themes and ideas. I'm not saying that the poems are simple themselves to explicate. Um, one of the interesting things that we saw, see, when the poem is transferred from the oral to the written tradition, which is pretty much an ethnographic exercise, is the attempt to replicate the dialogue as heard from the educated perspective of the person who is literate, who is writing it down, is trying to translate the language. So we'll see some really interesting spellings, a lot of um, abbreviations, a lot of apostrophes, that would be standing for the rest of a word that would be sounded out. So again, trying to replicate exactly as the ballad was sung and using the written language. So we see a little bit of slippage there sometimes. The themes of the ballad are often imaginative, highly imaginative, disturbing, fearful, sad, often themes of love and loss. And they could be love and loss between a parent and a child, as we see in Lord Randall. They could be between two lovers. Again, something that's kind of a new phenomenon, this idea of romantic love. But the themes are often will include a figure that could be seen as supernatural. The bloodhounds in Lord Randall could possibly be seen as a supernatural figure. Um, things that are a little bit outside of that explanation, that enlightenment explanation that everything makes sense, everything can be explained by science. This is not a mechanistic world. This is a world of superstition, a world of magic. And that is one of the things that drew the Romantic poets to it. 
But importantly, there's one piece that happens within those themes of all of the feelings. It's recognizing, valorizing the feelings of that peasant class, the common, the commoner, who previously had really been seen as just not having a lot of feelings, not being an individual with aspirations and, but simply there was a large divide between the common class and the nobility or the more educated classes. And by listening to these ballads that came from that peasant or common class, um, and really valorizing them and, it was a way, a way to actually recognize those feelings and sometimes valorizing them in a problematic way where it was almost too perfect. But we can speak more about that and we will see more of that if we go through. So here is the poem, Lord Randall. You also have it in your textbook. I'm not going to read through it. I will just point out a few things here. First of all, we see the repetition, Oh, where have you been, Lord Randall, my son? Oh, where have you been, my handsome young man? There is a small change in that in every stanza. The first four stanzas of the poem begin with the mother asking the son, Where have you been? Something about his evening. Where have you been? Where get ye your dinner, Lord Randall, my son? What got you to your dinner, or what did you have for dinner, we would say today, Lord Randall, my son. What became of your bloodhounds, Lord Randall, my son. And you can hear the heavy meter. You can hear the repetition. And you can, and every line ends, until the last stanza ends with, for I'm weary with hunting and fain would lie down. So we see that repetition. We see the A, B, a, B, C, B rhyme scheme. Lord Randall, my son, young man, soon down. Son, man, soon down. Son, man, soon down. And we'll notice that there's a repetition. Every, la, every stanza ends with exactly the same words here. So there's a very specific structure to this poem. And that structure is part of what gives it its power, especially as a musical poem. The imagery here is strong. There's a mother, a son, the wild wood. There's that wild wood that's out there, that dangerous world. And he's coming back and she can't protect him from the dangerous world. We find that the bloodhounds have died. And when we've learned that the bloodhounds have died, the bloodhounds who protect the son, then we know that the son himself has been poisoned is how the mother knows that because the blood, bloodhounds who would have protected him so that's one interpretation of the poem. Here are some questions for you. I'd like you to spend a little bit of time with the poem, looking at the overall feeling and theme. As you read this poem, what is your sense of feeling? Just in a couple of words, take your, some notes on it. Um, what happens in the ballad? What is the plot? Who narrates the poem? It's simply a piece of dialogue, isn't it? So how does the narration work? What about the language? We just spoke a little bit about how you can tell it's a ballad. You'll go ahead and do a little bit of your own analysis about the structure and tone of the poem. And finally, ask yourself, what about this ballad might be appealing to the romantics, to those romantic poets? What might compel them to think of it in that anti-enlightenment mode, in that mode of individualism that we've spoken about. And that's all I have for this lecture. I hope you enjoyed it, and we will see you in class. Too